we were definitely high on on just everything because we were just so unsure about what the outcome would be after the Kickstarter. We had met so many Kickstarter creators that had failed. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening whenever you may be listening. This is Latitude, the 43 North podcast. I'm your host, Nate Benson, digital media manager here at 43 North. And halfway through 30 episodes, you should know that by now. Uh, We have a great episode this week, but first, I just want to do a little house cleaning. Make sure you subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcasting app. And if you want to take three minutes, it only takes three minutes, head on over to iTunes, search for the Latitude 43 North podcast, and leave a five-star review. It helps our placement in iTunes, and, you know, our guest this week would very much appreciate a five-star review as well. Uh, This week, Oscar from Thimble. How are we doing? Hello, doing well, thank you. Oscar, for those who don't know you, why don't you tell us a little bit of who you are? Sure. Uh, so my name's Oscar Pedroso. I grew up in a small town outside of New York City called Mamaroneck. If you're not familiar, there are two towns, White Plains, New Rochelle. We're right in between those two. Uh, originally was born in Manhattan, grew up in Queens, moved out to the Burbs, went to high school in Mamaroneck, and then graduated, went to University of Rochester, which is what brought me to upstate New York and studied math and economics. And then from there, after I graduated college, I stayed and worked in higher ed. So I was working as a college admission officer and then started my own tutoring business on the side, which turned into an application consulting firm, got involved in the maker space there, uh, slowly transitioned into robotics a little bit, and then which became a big inspiration mm-hmm. for ideas, startup ideas that would become Gradfly, which was the previous venture that I started, and then Thimble, which is what we're working on now. So kind of a a serial entrepreneur, huh? Yeah. uh, I didn't really imagine it to get this far. Uh, But when I first started the tutoring company, it was fun, but it was just a one-man show, and Mm -hmm. I I wanted to be part of a team. And And so now you're growing a team at Thimble, huh? Yeah. Yeah. so how did you get the kind of entrepreneurial itch, so to speak? You know, it's a funny thing because no one in my family is an entrepreneur. Yeah. And I'm, t- I'm, def- I'm the first college graduate in my family and also the first entrepreneur in my family. <laughs> so everyone thinks first I'm First cra- of everything. Yeah, everyone thinks I'm crazy in my family because I should be you know, working nine to five with and try to get the benefits mm-hmm. <laughs> and then finally have those. Oh, good. You got it. <laughs> which is good. Yeah. Mom's proud. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I don't know. You know, it was one of those things where I, I had a tough time finding a job after college. Sure. And I, one of my first jobs was working in healthcare. So I worked at Rochester General Hospital as a grant writer. Terrible job. I mean, I learned <laughs> quite a few skills there, but... It was, I was hired under a grant, so the, the grant expired, and then I was back out looking for a job. Right. So I was considering business school, and I ended up uh, working in higher ed at the School of Engineering at, at U of R, so I thought this is great. Uh, but I still wasn't happy, and, mm-hmm. and, I, and I always thought success for me was creating something from nothing. And I really wasn't sure what that meant at the time, but I remember reading a lot of books regarding entrepreneurship. Okay. And it all started from just creating, starting with an idea, which I had a few at the time, and I thought, well, I can either go to business school to start a business, or mm-hmm. I could just, just start one. create my own business school and, and, and start from there. What books uh, kind of stuck out to you when you were kind of going through that early journey? Uh, let's see. Well, Lean Startup, we all know. That was definitely one of the ones that I read. Um, there was, oh, man, there were so many. Uh, there's the Innovator's Dilemma, which I read. Uh, gosh, drawing a blank. Oscar's Book Club will, will commence yeah, yeah, next yeah. week. I do have a book club, though. <laughs> They're all like, sitting on my shelf. I just yeah. haven't picked them up. In fact, when I, I, w- I was working, uh, I was working full time at the U of R, and I dropped down to part time so I could focus on some of my startup ideas. Sure. And I ended up taking up a restaurant job as a server, and I would bring in my books and read them and. Very often, a coworker would come by and, and ask me, "What, what the hell are you reading?" Yeah. <laughs> like, I, I'm reading the first paragraph here, and it means absolutely nothing. But to me, it meant something because I was, you know, learning whatever I was mm-hmm. at the time. So, tell me a little bit about Thimble. Well, Thimble is a monthly subscription. So, it's an education company. So, every month we we deliver 
an orange box in the mail with all the parts you need to build a specific kind of device. So it could be a robot, it could be a quadcopter, it could be an alarm clock. We curate everything so all the components are there. And then we have tutorials on our website that walk you through how to build each project from start to finish. And it's intended for beginners, so you, have, you don't have to have any experience when you receive this kit, mm -hmm. you log onto the website and, and follow the either the instructions or watch the tutorials and we teach you how to solder, assemble, and then program the project so that when you're done building it, you can make it do something fun. So no experience with, with programming or soldering or if so if I just wanna get started making something cool, Thimble might be uh, an Correct. attractive subscription service, huh? Yes. Uh, how did you come up with, uh, you know, discovering there was a need for something like this in the marketplace? Well, I think there are a variety of reasons why I started Thimble. One, I was already immersed in the education space just from working as a college admission officer. So that's where everything started. I was working with students who were building amazing projects. They were, uh, they were building these drones at home or in their garages and they it dawned on me at that time that the, there was a whole world out there outside of the university space with people who had ideas but didn't know how to bring these ideas to fruition. And by ideas, I'm talking about rovers, robots, anything you could think of that's cool and fun mm -hmm. in the electronic space. Uh, from there, I started a company called Gradfly. Now, when I was an, a college admission officer, I noticed a lot of students, brilliant engineering students, that we would interview who were still in high school, they would tell me, uh, th they would interview with me and then they could not really tell their story very well. Sure. So I thought of what if we created a tool where students could document their creations and their inventions. Okay. And that was the inspiration for Gradfly is we created a software where you can document, sort of create a portfolio like an artist would. And instead of showing off sculptures, you're showing off your cool robot you created this past weekend. Okay. And we would use that as a way for them to better showcase their projects, tell their story. Hopefully they're telling the story in front of someone who's gonna hire them for an internship or a job. So we were selling that software to two year and four year colleges. And so what we realized is that selling a, selling a school sucks because <laughs> <laughs> it's a long sales cycle. Yeah. The, ma the market was saturated with countless companies doing the same thing. And we were also working with very limited funds, which mm -hmm. made it difficult with the long sales cycle. Sure. So long story short, we ran out of money. But one of the things that I noticed very quickly was that there was a small community of people on that website that were identifying as electronic hobbyists who wanted to build cool stuff. They had ideas. Some didn't have ideas. Mm -hmm. The ones with ideas just had a tough time finding the components online. You know, some were going on AliExpress, DigiKey, um, and then from there, once they had all these components, they had to figure out how to construct everything. Sure. So that was when I signed up for a program in Toronto called Startup Next, which is a step up from Startup Weekend. Mm -hmm. It's put on by Google Entrepreneur. So I was commuting every Monday for eight weeks to Toronto. People thought I was crazy in, in Toronto. They were like, why are you driving <laughs> to, to Toronto from Buffalo every Monday? And I'm like, yeah. well... <laughs> You know, it's a little complicated, but yeah. here's this idea that I have, and I want to turn it into something. And so at that at that point, uh, I'd laid Gradfly to rest, but I was still going at it, and I hadn't quite really told anybody what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And then... Uh, and How hard was it to put put a startup to rest and kind of say, you know what, just one, it just this one didn't work? Yeah, it, it, it was hard in the sense that I wasn't ready to tell anyone. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, because there's a stigma with that, of course, yeah. unfortunately. No matter how hard you work at something, if it doesn't work out, well, yeah. I had a, I, a failure. Yes, there was a point where I said, this is not working, but I'm not giving up yet. Yeah. So Gradfly was almost dead, but I was trying to find some way to Keep yeah, it on life revive support. it. <laughs> Yeah, so Toronto, the, 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 the Startup Next program ended up helping tremendously because I walked in as a Gradfly founder and walked out of it being a Thimble founder. And uh, at that point, though, it was more like GitHub for hardware. Sure. Not a subscription box company that came when I met Dave, which was shortly after I graduated from the Startup Next program. Uh, but it was within like a three to four month period I was in the dark, but 
found my way with the right people and mm -hmm. made it happen. I first came across you guys January of 2016. You guys were running a Kickstarter at the time, right? Yes, we were. Uh, at that point, I was working with David for about almost a year. Yeah. And we had been going back and forth on whether we should do a crowdfunding campaign. And then, well, there was definitely, definitely a metaphor in the road because we, we only had like two grand in our bank accounts. So we were like, all right, if we're going to do this, let's go big and let's do this Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. we, and then and it took us about three or four months to plan for it. And, and we ended up going live with it December 8th of 2015. Mm -hmm. And our goal was $25,000. Our goal was to sell 500 units. Mm -hmm. And then in, in a 60 day period, we ended up exceeding our goal by 1200% and we raised just shy of 300,000. Wow. So number one <laughs> campaign in Buffalo still and Western New York. Um, so Thimble started several months, obviously prior to that, you guys, you, as you mentioned, GitHub kind of for parts. Um, mm -hmm. why did you guys shift? Uh, in reality, so when David came into the picture, I had presented everything that I'd worked on for the past year and a half when I, when I was working on Gradfly and he loved it. Mm -hmm. He loved, it. he's a computer engineer and he had worked at Intel, IBM, yeah. Sun Microsystems. So he's he been, had the nine to five job. You were doing yeah, the I know. nonsense. So, uh, <laughs> he, well, I presented the problem. I presented the market and he gave he he analyzed everything over the course of a month and then came up with about three four solutions mm -hmm. one of them was a subscription box company and a uh, concept and then the github for hardware was great but there were just already people in the space doing that really yeah. well so we were trying to figure out okay where do we fit in where nobody's really conquered that sure. that part of the market and at, at the time, we actually had a third co-founder. His name was Mike, and he was based in Toronto. And yeah, he had helped us think of a learning platform where you know you receive the kit, and then you go online and you watch a video of, mm -hmm. of whoever building the kit. Yeah, because unlike and you know Legos, you know you've got the instruction manual for Legos, but <coughs> you can really do whatever you want with this. If if you don't really put it together properly, it's not going to work, right? And right. Yes. I mean. You can finagle Tinker the parts, with it, yeah. yeah. But that's when like the experience comes in. Like, <laughs> you know what the components should do, what they should do, yes. and then reprogram it as you see fit. If you if you're really experienced, yes. I mean, there is soldering involved, so if yeah. you do mess that up, unfortunately, gonna you're gonna hit a brick wall. But yeah. we're pretty cool about that. Yeah. We'll we'll send you a new PCB. Yeah. It's not a problem. But then, so you guys, number one Kickstarter in, in West New York, you mentioned three hundred thousand dollars, which was great. Okay, so your Kickstarter ends now. What? Well, reality uh, sets in, right? <laughs> You've got yeah. I mean, twelve hundred percent more orders to fill. We were definitely high on on just everything because yeah. we were just so unsure about what the outcome would be after the Kickstarter. We had met so many Kickstarter creators that had yeah. failed. Yeah. And a few. I've, I've, I've supported a number of Kickstarters. That yeah. <laughs> I can pull up my wallet right now and, and show you my coin credit card, but that's a whole other yeah. podcast topic. But as soon as we achieved our goal in 48 hours, mm -hmm. the, the $25,000 that we, we were looking to, to raise, yeah. then it was just like, how big can this get? Yeah. And that was a big eye-opener eye for us because it was, it was validating for us as, 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 as far as whether a market existed for mm -hmm. for what we were doing we definitely saw other players in the space and but there wasn't anyone who was doing it as as we imagined it okay uh so and then everyone we met was like you guys are starry-eyed like <laughs> do you guys know how you're gonna do this and we didn't the answer so always yes so yeah, you know yeah. It, it's not. i know <laughs> um yeah it was just me and dave at that point so we we had committed to each other at that point, yeah. and we said, we're going to do this. We're, we're going to deliver on our promise like we said we would. And granted, we said we'd deliver in April. It really was December of 2016. Yeah. Uh, what were some of the hiccups? Um, part of it was just understanding the manufacturing process, yeah. the design, A lot of kids seem to run into that. You know, you have... Mm -hmm especially with the projects uh, similar to yours, at least from what I've read in other news reports where, you know, you do like 1,200% over your, your goal. It's like, okay, well, now you have to manufacture a scale. I 
wasn't anticipating that. Now what do I do? Yes. Yeah, that was an issue in the beginning. Just, I mean, we, when we had our bill of materials for the first kit, the first kit was the Wi-Fi robot. Mm -hmm. So it was a little remote control you could yeah. control from a phone or tablet. We were sourcing those parts ourselves on AliExpress, DigiKey. It was just uh, a hodgepodge. Of it was just right? awful because I was managing all these parts on an Excel sheet. And really what we needed was just someone with expertise who had a manufacturing background to help us do this. Mm -hmm. So fortunately, through an event I went to in Philadelphia, uh, I met a guy who had started a company called TV Be Gone. And he had told me about this manufacturer in China that he had worked with, had manufactured hundreds of different devices through him. So I thought, this guy must be reliable. Sure. So I reached out to him. And that was, that was uh, the introduction that he made. That was one of the first conversations we had with the manufacturer. And he's been doing all of our kits since then. So that, but that was, we didn't have that going into the Kickstarter. Yeah. So that took some time. And then uh, just the, the different design phases, testing, receiving samples, finally giving the green light for production, mm -hmm. all of that just took, I mean, we were pretty naive to think that, that we could get all that accomplished in three, four months. Yeah. Um, but it was a good thing because we learned, it took us a while to learn, but we, we know sure. how to do it now. So you've really been going kind of full throttle since December of last year in terms of a kit every couple of months, right? Yeah, right now, 2017 has all been about uh, perfecting the engineering and manufacturing process, shipping a kit every other month, and then starting in 2018, we'll be shipping every month. Wow. So how long's the pro how long's kind of the design process? Like what goes into designing something like that? Kind of walk us through designing yeah. a cool tech gadget because, you know, well, I think a lot of people don't have those experience in something like that. Yeah. Well, Ideas are not scarce, that's for sure. We have an Excel sheet with hundreds of projects mm -hmm. that we could create. Uh, and a lot of those ideas came from our first post ever on Reddit, sure. where we asked the community on there whether they would even buy into the concept. So there were a lot of ideas that came from there. Amplifiers, robots, weather stations, I mean, you think of, uh, you name it, and it was on that. Sure. So a lot of those uh, ideas have become our roadmap for kits we deliver in the future. David also had really good ideas, and, and the first 12 kits are pretty much our ideas mm -hmm. only, and then we have other ideas that came from that Reddit post I was just sure. telling you about for later. Uh, but w so the idea is like... Ha They're it, easy. It, the, that, that, that part's easy. I think the next part... Executing. Yeah, is, is coming up with, with the design, what, mm -hmm. the, what the project's going to look like, what the materials are. So we're working under a certain cost. Yeah, I was going to say, it's a certain yeah. price point you got to make this thing under. <laughs> yeah, so whatever parts, whatever parts we use, we have to make sure that the quality's there, that they're not too expensive, that it puts us over our, our bill of material costs. So um, there's that part. And then ensuring that it meets certain guidelines on the educational side, because we're really creating these projects so that people can learn. So then the last thing we want is for someone to get their kid and be completely overwhelmed by learning how to build sure. it. So you mentioned targeting this for people who want to learn. So who is kind of your the ideal thimble audience? Is it a, a kid in his basement? Is it a classroom? Like where do you want to see these projects uh, kind of a, on a monthly basis? Well, right now we're direct to consumer and that's always been the idea. Learn how to build anything at home. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're also thinking about schools. But up until this point, our, our, our primary customer has been two different types of people. One is a hobbyist who's sure. already familiar with a lot of the components. They're the ones that build our kits in one, two, three, and then they end up adding cool parts to it, cool yeah. sensors, and make it do something that we hadn't originally intended right. the, the, the kit to do, which is still fun to see. The other type of customer are parents. So a, a lot of um, engineering, a lot of parents with an engineering background, IT, software, who have a son or daughter, between the ages of six and 18, and they want to get them into uh, either an education or career path in STEM, okay. so science, tech, engineering, math. And the, I'd say those are our bread and butter right there. Mm -hmm. uh, but we receive a lot of inquiries from schools who want to see these in the classroom. And that's great for us. Like, I would love, we're already in classrooms right yeah. now. It's just we're not actively pursuing it because we just don't have the bandwidth. Right. 
However, a lot of the teachers that find us, they end up buying the subscriptions out of pocket. and Like a lot yeah. of supplies I, teachers do. Yeah, and I <laughs> we call them the freak teachers because they're the ones that are most excited yeah. about teaching these things in the classroom. So I end up being the one that's engaging with them, and, and um, we try to learn as much as we can from them because we do think there are differences in how the kids are being used in the classroom versus yeah. how they're being used at home. Uh, but, yeah, there's a lot of potential there <laughs> so how's the uh you know it's been a year of, of focusing on shipping and, and designing and and gaining new members how has the growth been this year growth so i'd say growth hasn't been huge this this year mm-hmm. um but it's a good thing because it, what we were really going for was retention we we had all these customers from kickstarter and some from our online store once we launched the the website sure um, but uh, so w- let me go back a little bit. So last December we had an e- well, last November a year from today, a year ago today we hadn't delivered anything, mm-hmm. and we were eight months past the Kickstarter. Yeah, we were just getting ready. It turns out that everything was just m- panning out to be ready right before Christmas, yeah. which is like great. <laughs> you know, <laughs> put us in a little bit of a frenzy because yeah. people wanted these yeah. under their Christmas trees. Yeah, fortunately, the post office is not busy during this time of year. To, yeah, to yeah, that didn't help at all. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was a, a little bit of a nightmare the closer we got to the holiday, but it, we ended up getting through it. Yeah. Um, and, but your team has grown too, though. I mean, not just from, so from, not just from a subscriber base, but the Thimble team itself has grown pretty substantially, right? Yes. I mean, it was me and Dave up until full time, at least up until this past June. We've had college interns mm-hmm. throughout the summers, um, part-time help. We partnered up with UB through their career experience program, so we were able to hire a student, uh, an engineering student from UB, and then UB paid for their time, so that, that helped us tremendously. Mm-hmm. And actually now, da- David Dressner, you'll see him. He's got the curly hair yeah. glasses. He's now full-time. <laughs> there you go. Uh, but So, I mean, growth wasn't... You know, people like think, you know, wow, you had this amazing Kickstarter and you're going to grow fast now. And yeah. that, that really wasn't, a, it wasn't about that. Um, like in retrospect now, I think right. what we really should have been focusing on was, all right, let's make sure that we have the systems and processes set up in place so that we're always delivering on time so that it's never an issue. And then let's focus on growth. Mm-hmm. Um, we could have, we could have grown a lot if we wanted to, but we decided to push all that capital towards production and why uh, why focus on on that instead of and I think this is more or less a, a, a question other entrepreneurs would want to know like mm-hmm. how, why make that decision to do one thing versus the other yeah well it just wouldn't have made sense we could have put the money towards growing super fast uh, like we were spending a year ago we were spending about two to three k on Facebook ads and we were bringing in about 150 to 200 subscribers. We could have put in a lot more money if we wanted to. I mean, we didn't have a ton of money, first of all, to play with. Mm-hmm. But what it would what would have been more disappointing is having spent all this money acquiring all these customers and then disappointing them because we couldn't deliver on time. Yeah. And so that's why we chose to do deliver every other month, be upfront with our customers about the delivery, the 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 stagnant shipping, sure. and then make sure we have all our ducks in a row, and then go full throttle, which is where we're at now. And hoping to go every month starting next year. Oh yeah, huh? yeah, yeah. We're 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 super excited. I mean, we we have as far as our team, you know, David CTO, yeah, David Dressner's hardware engineer. We have Patty who's helping us with customer service and shipping. Rachel, we just brought on as director of marketing. Ian, software engineer, and these are all roles that we were we were just wished we had somebody yeah. helping us with. Yeah, like a year ago you didn't have it. Yeah, a year ago we didn't have it, and we were so wishing for for someone to help us with with those things. But now, now we do. <laughs> um, so, what are you hoping for in, in, in the next year? Uh, you know, this year was a year of growth. Uh, next year, I would imagine a year of growth too. You mentioned the the con- uh, commitment to ship every month, but what are you kind of hoping for? And I'll preface this with: you never know what kind of guy with money might be listening to this podcast. So. <laughs> True. <laughs> Uh, so 2018 is really going to be growth. Right now we have a little over 1,000 subscribers. Wow, okay. And so we're looking to get to 3,000 by the end of 2018. 
And there are just a lot of things that we can do. We want to create more content for our for our sus- subscribers. We have a community forum where people are engaging with each other, but we want to do a better job of making sure that they're on there. And mm-hmm. um, we want to send out more communication on what our plans are. So we're launching one of the cool things that we're doing for 2018 is we're launching a curriculum. Okay. So if if you think of it as like level one through five, yeah. If you know absolutely nothing, start there. You start at level one, so you probably won't get something that involves soldering. But uh, if you do have some experience, or you graduate into fu- uh, future levels, then you're learning these new skills over time. You're learning how to solder eventually. You're playing with more advanced code. Um, at some point, level five is going to be equivalent to college level engineering, wow. uh, coding. So. It's just, it's just a box of parts and hope for the best, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Here you go. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be great. Great for April first if you can get it, get that box. Yeah. For April first, <laughs> the, the get good luck box. Yes. Um, well, Oscar, if people want to uh, get engaged with Thimble, subscribe to Thimble, uh, what do they have to do? Uh, so you could find us on our website. That's thimble.io, and uh, you'll find our story on there, our online shop. You can also check out our tutorials at learning.thimble.io if you want to take a glance at what our tutorials are like. We do all the teaching, so it feels like a cooking show, except we're making robots instead of cake. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can also find us on Facebook. Great. And we won't reveal the pricing. You'll have to go to thimble.io to subscribe. So (laughs) call to action. Head over to thimble.io. Oscar, thanks for joining us on the podcast this week. We'll catch up with you sometime down the road. Thanks so much, Nate. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you guys at the next one.